Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I wanted to talk, uh, inshallah, today about um, a topic that hopefully we all know about and we're all very, um, that we all are interested in. I mean, I think this event, uh, as the title of the slides that you'll see, it's on the celebrating the, the beloved of Allah sub, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallam, of course. But this topic that I wanted to talk about specifically is on love, because this is really ultimately a gathering of love, right? We're coming here to celebrate uh, the month, the birth month of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're coming here as um, a testimony of our love for him, as well as for our community, for one another. So I think this topic of love is, is something that we should uh, explore together. So bismillah. So what is love? Anybody, anybody want to shout out some answers? This word that we throw around a lot, that we hear a lot. And I know there's a lot of people who have opinions about it, but what is it? Yes. Respect. Respect. MashaAllah. That's beautiful. Anyone else? What does love to mean to you? Yes. Care, devotion. Beautiful. I love these terms. Worth? Do I hear? Worthy? Mercy. Oh, mercy. I'm sorry. Mercy. Mercy. Mashallah. What else? Yes? Attachment. Very nice. Mashallah. Beautiful. Yes? Deep reverence. Deep reverence. Beautiful answers. I hope everybody's paying attention. These are beautiful. Yes? Affection. Yes? Alhamdulillah, all of them, I think, are correct answers. Yes? Surrendering. MashaAllah, surrendering. Amazing. Yes? Obedience. Wow. Have you looked at my slides? Because <laughs> you're going to see stuff then. MashaAllah. So if you look up the word love, the dictionary definition actually has it divided into both a noun and a verb which I think is uh, important to, because, you know, some, as some of your answers, some of, um, you know, the ways that we define love uh, reflect our emotions, right? They're, they're things that we feel. But then there's other things that are more actionable. So here are the ones that I just pulled from the Internet. But an intense feeling of, effect, of deep affection, right, which was said, a great interest and pleasure in something. That's how many people use this term love, right? And then actionable love is where you feel um, a deep affection for someone and, and uh, express it, right? And then, um, or just to have, uh, to enjoy something very much. So there's these, this is a d different ways that we experience love. As I said, many people throughout the course of history have, of course, um, given their interpretations of this wor uh, word or this concept. Uh, one I thought that was really interesting were the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. They actually divided love into eight different types of love. So I thought it was good to explore this a little bit because, of course, in the course of our lives, we're going to experience different forms of love. In fact, just recently um, with some of my students, I was going over the beautiful hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is divided, which is a form of love, right, is divided into a hundred parts, one part which is in this earthly realm, right? We, inshallah, this is a beautiful hadith, you should know this hadith, but I was going over it with my students and explaining to them that that one uh, part of, of Allah's love, right, this one uh, part that he's distributed in this world is responsible for, or the source of, I should say, every form of love that we experience. So all the different love that you have for your family members, your uh, friends, your community members, every person who you feel an attachment to, a strong uh, you know, bond to, is, is sourced from this one part of, of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa has distributed in the world. And then where are the remaining 99? Who knows? Where are they? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and where, when are we going to experience or see that? Yes. On the day of judgment, in the hereafter. Mm -hmm. In Jannah, inshallah, all of these are correct, right? The remaining 99 parts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reserved for the believers on the day of judgment. So this should give us immense hope and, of course, should increase our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if all of the love that we experience in this earthly, earthly realm, not just between human beings, by the way, even between animals, amounts to only one part and 99 are remaining for us, inshallah, we're accounted amongst the believers. Wow, right? Just sit with that for a moment. Wow. But 
you know, here are different experiences of love that we may have felt before, right? Um, and you can look at the terms, and then they show the sources of them. So I thought it was interesting because, again, we sometimes have very shallow uh, understanding of these terms that we hear a lot. We'll say, I love you, without really thinking about the depth of, of what we're saying, or maybe maybe we do feel deeply, but we don't know how to express it. So it's good to understand the potentiality of, of you know, the, the feelings that we have, but also to... to to try to figure out what is the purest form of it, because there's so many forms, but what is ultimately the purest form of love, right? And that's really, I think, the question at the heart of what we uh, we as believers should should hope to uh, answer or get at least an answer to at some point in our lives. What is that, and can we feel that? Can we experience true, pure, unadulterated love? Because there's so many different uh, experiences of love. Now, you may have seen this picture before, but I love this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures to use in my slides because it's conveys so much or so much power in this picture what is this what are these anybody know mm -hmm. good so you've seen this picture before a lot of people are surprised to learn these are actually all different forms uh, of water so they're not different liquids right if you look at it uh, on first glance you might think oh, okay there are different drinks here there's juice here there's you know tea here coffee but it's actually water and as you can tell there's I mean, to think that, you know, some of this is water is pretty, I think, revolting, right? We would not want to drink every cup here. We would want to drink only the purest uh, cup because that's what water means to us, right? So in the same way, when we think of love, we should want to remove and filter through all the things that we attach our hearts to that are not deserving, right? Because there's a lot of things that people become attached to, even people, right? People become attached to other people. People become attached to material things. And all that does is take away and distract you from the highest form of love, what we should really attach our hearts to, of course, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we need to look no further than to look at what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think of love, right? Well, how does he define love? What does he tell us about love? What is this word according to him since he is the source of love? We don't even know. I mean, if, if you really think about it, how do we even know what love is? It's because it's part of his attribute, right? He's al-wadud. So without you know, we, we, the only way that we even feel this emotion is through him. Therefore, we should look to him to at least try to understand how does he want us to love, right? And this is where you will see in chapter 3, verse 31 to 32, this is the answer. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ قُلْ أَتِيُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say, if you love God, follow me, and God will love you and forgive you your sins. And God is forgiving, merciful. And say, obey God and obey the messenger. If they turn away, then truly God does not love the disbelievers. This is it. This is the formula. This is the highest form of love. And in this verse is everything we need to know about how we should love and what type of love we should be preoccupied with. Because, you know, worldly love will come and go. And I'm sure many people in this room have experienced heartbreak before because of worldly love. But when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart will never be broken. In fact, the opposite will happen. When you put your efforts into loving Allah and his messenger, your heart will become stronger and more fortified. And nothing can break it. No one can break it. You can receive the most devastating news ever. But because your heart is entrenched and, and drowning in the love of Allah and the Prophet you will stay afloat. So this is really the uh, the purest, the highest form, and this is the way that we can navigate this dunya. Without the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people drown. Dunya is a place of tribulation, of pain, and it's because people either have insufficient, deficient, or absent love in their heart for Allah um, that they can't, that they have a difficult time here. But when we can really focus on developing this, inculcating this, and learning how to get rid of all those other attachments, that's when you start to see this strength that comes and this ability to just endure, inshallah. So. 
I wanted to share one of the most powerful stories of love that we're describing, because I'm describing this amazing love. Well, one of the great stories uh, from the Sira that I think really conveys this is the story of one of the companions of the Prophet mm -hmm. named Julay Bib. If you don't know this story, I really hope that uh, you'll read into it more, but I'm going to share it with you here. Julay Bib was one of the companions who took, uh, who became Muslim uh, with the Ansar of Medina. And he, his name actually conveys a lot about him. Um, his name means literally small grown or even deformed. That's the way that it was, you know, he was named. Um, and why? Because he was actually quite small in stature, very frail, very thin. And some of the descriptions say that he was very unattractive as well. He actually looked, uh, you know, uh, just not, not very appealing. And because of that, he was ostracized. He was teased a lot. He was also an orphan. So he had no lineage, no support, no family backing. And this was, you know, a, a time and a place where that, those things mattered. If you had at least family and lineage, you could be protected. So he had nothing. He had no money, no wealth, n n no features, no, no traits about him that anybody deemed worthy, except for, of course, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, uh, he was, and this is, you know, prior to Islam, but he was uh, bullied so often that he actually um, was ostracized from the men of, of Medina and he would take refuge and comfort with the women because they were actually compassionate towards him. That's how he was mistreated so poorly. So the um, when he accepted Islam, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, saw in him qualities that were beautiful because he didn't look for, to the outward, right? This is the the difference between having uh, the the proper you know sight because some we can see, for example, right? We we see things, but if you don't have uh, you know the the discernment to know what's truly of value and what's not, then you're not going to see things according to their true value. So the Prophet ﷺ saw people not for their outward ex appearance. He didn't judge people based on the the way that they were dressed or their you know status or their names he looked at character and he looked at he could penetrate between you know from all of that and see into the to their soul and so he saw Julie Biba as being very special and someone of immense worth to the point that he actually went to a very prominent family of Medina who had a daughter who she's not known, we don't know her name, but this woman, this young girl was very sought after. She, a lot of the Sahaba were, uh, she had many suitors. And so the family was a wealthy family and uh, she was quite stunningly beautiful. And the Prophet said, I imagine, here's a man who everybody looks at as being worthless, as nothing. And the Prophet said, um, chose to be his uh, representative, his advocate to this family. And he went up to uh, the, the father of this family and he said, I, I'm asking for your daughter's hand in marriage. And so he, of course, was so overjoyed because the, he thought it was the Prophet says, I'm asking for himself. And who better than the best of creation to hand his daughter over to? So he was like, he was so happy. And then the Prophet says, I'm told him, I'm actually not asking on my behalf. And as soon as he asked him, then who, you know, assuming that it must be another companion like Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr or Sayyidina Umar or one of the other, uh, you know, great companions. And he was told it was Julay Bib. He was shocked, but he didn't want to have bad adab with the Prophet said him. So he said, I need to ask her mother. Let, let me uh, consult with her. And he immediately went to her and he conveyed that this proposal had come. And she had the same initial reaction. Oh, the Prophet said, is asking for our daughter. How amazing. And he had to tell her, no, 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 no. He's not asking for himself. He's asking for someone else. Who? Julay Bib. And she began to scream hysterically. She was like, absolutely not. No way, no way. And Audhu Billah, she made some very um, egregious statements that were, uh, what she said was, was inappropriate, uh, swearing by Allah that she would never, ever, ever marry her daughter to Julebi because he was seen as so low and beneath her. Now, I want you to imagine this scene unfolding. You know, she's screaming, and her daughter, this beautiful girl who everybody is eyeing and vying for, she hears her mother screaming, comes and says, what's going on? And they tell her that the Prophet has asked for your hand for uh, Julay Bib. And this girl, mashallah, again, we don't know her name. Subhanallah, what a demonstration of love for the Prophet and trust 
in the Prophet Sallallahu this is true love. She immediately turned to her parents who were like, there's no way we're marrying you to him, don't worry. And she said, how could you go against the Prophet Sallallahu He would never wish anything wrong for me. He would never want anything but my khair for me. I will accept this proposal. Shocked, right? Everybody's, I mean, this is like, a huge shock to, to everyone that here is this girl who everybody's vying for and she's going to marry Julie Bib. But why did she do it? Because she had that love for the Prophet that she didn't question him. She didn't question that he really wanted her khair. Even if the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the optics didn't look like something that was good or favorable to other people. She knew in her heart of hearts that because it came from the Prophet ﷺ, it was worthy. SubhanAllah, they were married and they lived peacefully together until uh, Julaybib was uh, one of the companions in, in a battle. Again, it's not mentioned which one, but he was martyred. Now, this is where, SubhanAllah, we see... The story, I mean, just again, trying to imagine this scene unfolding because here's a man orphaned and we, we've described how people perceived him. But to the Prophet him, clearly he was of great importance to the point that during the battle or after the battle, the Prophet him turned to his companions asking each one of them if they have found anyone missing, you know, from their family, from their uh, people, from their tribe. Did you find anyone missing? Is anyone missing amongst you? And they, would, they said so and so and so and so. He again asked, is there anyone missing amongst you? And they said, so-and-so. He then again is asking them, like, you know, again, eagerly trying to, to locate someone, right, of importance to him. And now he, he reveals it. And he says, after they've repeatedly said, uh, no, there isn't anybody, he says, what? But I am missing Julebib. In other words, you know, he's important to me. You may have found all these other people who are your family members, your people, but I'm missing someone very special to me. That's who this man, his rank was with the Prophet Sallallahu And so the companions began to search for him and they found that he had been martyred. There were seven bodies laying around him and the Prophet Sallallahu came heartbroken to see that he had been martyred. But of course, um, you know, he, he conveyed uh, that, that what had happened. He said that he had been martyred, these, that he had killed these seven, and then one of them must have uh, finally killed him. And then he said, and he said this beautifully, two to three times it's reported in the hadith. He said, Hadha minni wa ana minhu, hadha minni wa ana minhu. Repeating this so that every single person there saw what the Prophet was conveying, that you all, all of you at some point, thought of this man as nothing, but he is from me and I am from him, right? We are the same, in other words, we're the same. And he made sure to repeat it th two to three times. And then, because he was so small and so frail, Judebib as, as a person, the Prophet said him, picked him up by his own arms he didn't need anybody else. And if you've ever, uh, you know, been, been around a, a funeral procession or anything like that, you know it's not actually very, it's not easy to pick up uh, someone, but that's how small he was, that he was able to lift him and he placed him in, in the ground. He, he dug his grave, he buried him himself. Um, and, and that was, you know, the story that I think, to me anyway, of, um, one of many that conveys really love in so many different ways, so many forms of love, right? Because again, if you look at this beautiful um, sister, we don't know again her name, who is demonstrating to all of us that when you truly love and understand who the Prophet ﷺ is, then you don't question his guidance for you. And we live in an age where a lot of people, you know, think, Think, think that their own um, interpretation of something or, you know, they, they, they start to question things and they don't sit, sit and think, wait a second, who am I ultimately questioning, right? Because the Prophet said him first and foremost, didn't convey anything from his own self. Everything that he taught us, everything that he taught us to do or told us not to do is directly revealed to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So th this is something that we can at least learn from her example, that as soon as she came to understand that something was from the Prophet said him, that was enough for her. So now all of us have to ask ourselves this question. When I read something, when I read a hadith or when I read a ruling that applies to me maybe as a woman or just in general, my role, you know, in, in this faith, do I question, you know, where it comes from? Do I sit and have this internal debate thinking, is it really good for me? 
Or am I truly a, a, a lover of the Prophet ﷺ? Am I truly a believer that what, when, if he said something, it is haq, it is true, and he completed his mission, right? This is one of the qualities of the Prophets is they don't lie and they complete their mission. Everything that the Prophet ﷺ was taught to convey to us has been conveyed. The deen is perfect. So there's nobody that's going to come and suddenly they're going to have these realizations that you know, haven't been worked out before. We have to have the humility to know this. So this is how we demonstrate true love. If a love is on the tongue, but it's not in the heart, then there's something missing, right? And that's where, again, we need to question how can we truly love and also how can we be beloved, right? And this is it. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is initiated in the heart. This is where it comes. It starts here. We should truly feel immense love for our Creator who gave us existence, who gave us all of the blessings that we have. And then, of course, our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for conveying the truth to us. We could have been drowning in darkness just like so many people, but here we are. We have, alhamdulillah, the gift of Islam because he fulfilled his mission. So it should initiate in the heart, and then we express it on the tongue. We say, alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah, and we mean it. We literally mean it alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-islam these are words that should f like surge through us like alhamdulillah thank you god thank you allah for making me muslim i could have been anything thank you and really feel it and then it comes out through the limbs through action it comes out in what sincere submission gratitude and obedience and so this was a beautiful little excerpt that was in the study quran on the tafsir of this verse that i thought was really worth mentioning it says that the quran mentions god's love for human beings much more often than their love for god that right away should make us all feel really small right that that we that allah is so worthy of our love but subhanallah we we don't show that we don't reflect it as much as we should and then it goes on to say in islamic spirituality it is more important to be considered beloved than a lover of god as reflected in one of the names of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam habib allah whose primary meaning is the beloved of God, though it can also mean the lover of God. The Sufis say that we cannot be the beloved of God without loving him, and we cannot love him unless he loves us. So this is how, again, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how we earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then it's, it's like a beautiful uh, you know, a cycle that just continues, but it starts with our obedience. And so quickly, again, I might, might be over time, I apologize, but the obstacles to our obedience is what we also need to examine, because if we're not being obedient, if we're in any way having shak doubt or something, sometimes you know, people fall into ruts and that's normal. Spiritually, you're not always gonna be um, you know, inc uh, inclining, you're gonna have those moments of stagnation. That's normal, as long as we don't regress or go down, we should always assess what's going on. And so the four obstacles is ignorance. So if you feel like you're in a rut, you need to learn. And this is where, alhamdulillah, organizations like the Rahma Foundation and other uh, wonderful initiatives, where especially um, that are in support of women, learning from other women, we need to support. But seek out knowledge. Don't be the type of person that just is like, well, I don't feel as motivated as I did last year or um, last month or in Ramadan, what's going on? Do something about it. Take action. So learn. The next is weakness. And this is where if you have questions about certain things, ask questions. It's a very important uh, thing to convey because sometimes again people feel shy but remember what the prophet said about the, the women of medina he praised them and said that they did not let their shyness prevent them from asking questions so if you have shak or doubt about something and you want certainty ask questions don't stand in your own own way and not to say that anyone is uh, an expert on everything but inshallah we'll be able to get the answers to you through all of the wonderful teachers that we have access to but ask and then long hopes if you are stuck uh thinking about um, or if you are, um, if you if you have what we call tul al amal, where it's a disease of the heart, you keep putting things off, right? Procrastination. This is a disease of the heart. You have to stop. Nobody is promised anything. We're not promised tonight, let alone tomorrow, let alone the next day, uh, or or the day after. So get. Be a person of action and be a person who really understands that life is temporal and also unpredictable and that you can't do that if you're going to run away from death. You cannot be realistic about life and have proper goals and, and really organize your time well if you don't reflect on death enough. It's the way to actually get your heart 
in the right order. Because again, the dunya is a place of distraction. Death is the, is the way to wake up. It's like a, spla a splash of cold water when you're you know, in a sombered state. That's how you're going to wake up, is remember, death can come and seize you or your loved ones at any minute. Are you prepared? If you're not, what are you doing? And then the last thing to look at as well is if your risk is not halal, if you are consuming anything that's haram, and this doesn't, I mean, most of us, inshallah, are following the dietary rules, but what about the income that we're taking in? What Are we actually mindful of that? Are we giving our sadaqah? Are we giving our zakat? Are we distributing our wealth as we should to purify it? If we're not doing these things, then likely we're going to uh, not be able to be on task, be on top of our prayers, be on top of our other things. These are all hindrances. These are all obstacles. So this is how we, again, check ourselves through obedience uh, in, in terms of figuring out what, what's going on. And then the four paths to actually making sure that we're doing things as we should, salah. We can't say this enough. Prayers, prayers, prayers is the very first thing that we're going to be called on on, on the Day of Judgment, the, very, the most important thing that we do. If you're not praying your five days, but you're going to maulid and you're singing nasheeds, wake up. You get, that's a problem. There's a disconnect there. You've got to be praying your five days, uh, five prayers. And then Quran. Again, Quran is the greatest uh, dhikr, the greatest thing that we can be occupying ourselves with outside of our prayers. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no greater speech. There's nothing more uh, valuable to listen to, to read, to engage with. You can have a, a books library full of books, but if you don't engage with the Quran, again, there's a disconnect. And if you don't know how to read the Quran, this is a problem. Seek, ask, email. Can I get a teacher? And I, mashallah, I get sisters all the time asking, I need to get my, just yesterday, subhanAllah, I was at an event, and a sister who is a mother working, very eager to learn Quran, because she sees this as a priority that she's neglected. This is the kind of uh, discipline we need. So reading the book of Allah subhanAllah beautifully, with joy and devotion, seeking forgiveness and guidance, dua. We have to continuously make dua, always. Asking dua for ourselves, forgiveness for our sins, as well as those we love, and in the absence of, of others. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, just you don't have to share your du'as, make them private. And dhikr, being in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing salawat often and contemplating. This is how we get our uh, self back on the path of obedience. And again, when we come in celebrations like this, we're celebrating the, the life of the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The point of this is to bond our hearts, but also to check ourselves, to check our claims that we make. Because it's very easy to claim that you love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if it's not showing in your actions, again, there's a disconnect. So this is where, inshallah, we can, um, again, hold ourselves accountable and truly uh, present with, with real love um, and, and, uh, and inshallah have the Prophet Sallallahu be pleased with us uh, in this life and, and in the next inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.